found out that my wife was secretly a member of this club and then drama unfolded. Hey everyone on Reddit, my name's Tyler, and I guess this is where we spill the beans, right? The stories that are too real for our everyday fine thanks conversations? Well, buckle up, because here's mine. I'm a 40-year-old dude living in the tech-vibrant city of Austin, Texas. By day, I'm the brains behind some of the most talked about AI projects that you might have seen making the rounds on tech blogs. I'm talking code that's meant to make life easier, or at least that's the plan. My wife, Rachel, she's been the artsy type since the day I met her. Now a freelance graphic designer with a keen eye for what makes things pop on a screen. Together, we've ridden the roller coaster that is the Austin scene. Me with my app launch parties, her with gallery showings where the wine flows as freely as the critiques. We've had a good run for the past decade, our home often a mosaic of my tech gadgets and her vibrant canvases. But here's the kicker, folks, the reason why I'm hammering out my heart and soul into this keyboard. Rachel's been distant lately. I don't mean the busy with a deadline kind of distant, that I get. This is cold, almost like she's a hologram in our home. Her laughter doesn't ring as loud, her smile doesn't reach her eyes, and man, it's like pulling teeth to get her into bed. Not for sleep, mind you, but for the kind of midnight tango we used to dance without a second thought. Nowadays, there's always an excuse, a not tonight tie, or a I'm just not feeling it, followed by the turn of her back and the silent void expanding between us. At first, I figured it was just a phase, you know? Everyone gets the blues or a touch of the no libido flu. But then it stretched out, one week, two weeks. Heck, the calendar pages kept flipping, and my bed became as barren as Mars. I've always been the guy with a plan, a solution, a way to debug life like it's one of my programs. But this? Man, I felt like I'd hit a wall, and behind it was a Rachel I couldn't reach, locked away with secrets I couldn't fathom. So there I was, staring at our joint credit card statement like it was some kind of ancient script written in a lost language. Hey everyone. Unfortunately, basically everyone who is watching these videos isn't subscribed. It would mean the world to me to quickly get out of the full screen video for three seconds and press that subscribe button. It's free and you can unsubscribe anytime. Sorry for bothering and thank you so much if you subscribed. Charges from places we've never been to together started to dot the landscape of our bill. A fancy restaurant downtown where, believe me, they serve steaks that cost more than a pair of my sneakers. A boutique hotel, that's the kind of place you'd take someone to say, hey, you're special, and not in the kind of way you'd expect a wife to be spending without her husband. And then there was Rachel, who'd become as secretive as a teenage girl with her first crush. Every time I walked into a room, I'd hear the click of her laptop slamming shut faster than the doors on a bank vault. Phone calls ended with the suddenness of a TV show canceled mid-season. She was whispering like she was plotting to steal the crown jewels. I mean, I'm not a jealous guy by nature. I'm the dude who's secure enough to say, yeah, she's mine, and not worry when she's out there being her fabulu self. But folks, my gut was screaming louder than fans at a rock concert, telling me something wasn't right. There's a line between trust and being a blind fool, and I felt like I was tightrope walking right over it. The trouble with gut feelings, though, is that you can't take them to court. You need cold, hard facts, evidence that would stand up and say, here's the truth, without a stutter. And I had nothing but whispers and shadows, the kind of stuff that would make anyone else say, Ty, you're just being paranoid. But come on, when your bedroom's gone ice cold and your wife is more mysterious than a spy movie, you tell me how you'd react. And let's not forget those hushed phone calls, like she's sharing secrets that could start World War III. So there I was in our local coffee shop, just a guy and his latte in the corner, the unofficial observer of the daily grind. That's when I caught a snippet of conversation that had my ears perking up like a hound on the scent. Two guys in suits, and I'm not talking off the rack specials, were jabbering about some group that sounded like it stepped right out of a James Bond flick, specializing in discreet relationships for the married crowd. Now, I'm no eavesdropper by trade, but this was too much of a coincidence. What are the odds, right? So I did what any man desperate for answers would do. I sidled up, casual-like, and threw in a comment about the espresso that led to a chat about what's good around here. Before you know it, 
I'm pretending to be Mr. Interested and they're spilling the beans about secret signals. Here's the kicker. The secret handshake of this club? A black ring. Not just any ring, mind you, but one worn specifically on the right hand. A mark of the inner circle, a discreet bat signal for the cheating elite. I chuckled and played along, but inside, my heart was doing the kind of drum solo you'd pay good money to see. Later, back at the ranch, that's my less than homely home these days, I decided to do some late spring cleaning. And lo and behold, what should I find tucked away in Rachel's jewelry box behind some trinkets and baubles? A black ring, shiny and smug like it knew secrets it shouldn't. The same kind those suited up double-O wannabes were talking about. So there it was, the piece of the puzzle that slapped me in the face with a cold I told you so. It felt like a gut punch and an aha moment all rolled into one. There was my proof, not shouting, not whispering, but just sitting there silent and damning. So there I was, late one night, just mindlessly scrolling through Facebook to distract myself from the deafening silence in our bedroom. It's amazing what you find when you're not looking for anything, right? That's when I saw it, a suggested group hidden in plain sight among the ads. It was one of those private groups, but the name caught my eye. Austin's Discreet Meat. Curiosity's a beast, and mine was clawing its way out. I clicked. Denied access. It was members only. But the public description was enough. A discreet community for those seeking to add a spark back into their lives. Sparks. Right. The kind you get from rubbing two sticks together, or apparently, from sneaking around behind your partner's back. Then one evening, I'm charging Rachel's old tablet. You know, the one she stopped using after I gifted her a shiny new iPad. And there it was, the very same Austin's Discreet Meet Facebook group left open, staring at me from the screen. My Rachel, her name in the members list, as bold as you like. But that wasn't all, folks. Alongside the tablet, tucked away in her nightstand, was that black ring I'd read about in the group's posts, a symbol for members to recognize each other in the wild. It all clicked into place like a twisted puzzle. The late nights, the brushed off advances, the mysterious expenses. I'm telling you, the feeling of betrayal is a gnawing animal that settles in your stomach and refuses to leave. You think you know someone, right? 10 years, and now she's a stranger with a double life that's just popped up like one of those annoying ads, except there's no little X to close this window. After finding the black ring and the not-so-innocent Facebook group on Rachel's tablet, I knew what I had to do. I couldn't just sit back and let this play out without getting the full picture. So your boy went full mission impossible mode. I started off by setting up a fake Facebook profile. Yeah, I know. Welcome to Catfish City, population, me. But desperate times call for desperate measures, right? I spent a couple hours making my alter ego believable. I borrowed a photo of a buddy from college who now lives overseas. Sorry, Dave, but you're Jameis now, an out-of-towner who's just moved to Austin. With James all set up, I sent a join request to Austin's discreet meet. While waiting for approval, I couldn't help feeling like I was crossing some line but then I remembered that line had already been crossed, just not by me. A day later, and bingo, I'm in. The group was like an alternate universe, people chatting and planning meetups, all under the guise of discretion. And there it was, pinned at the top, an announcement for a masquerade-themed event. Perfect cover for anonymity and for me to slip in unnoticed. The event was in a few days a masquerade ball at some ritzy joint that looked like it was straight out of a movie where the rich and unfaithful play their games. Next step, getting a costume. I hit up a local costume shop and got myself decked out. I'm talking a full-on feathered Venetian mask and a cloak that would make Dracula envious. Rachel always liked those vampire movies, right? A cruel twist of irony there, but a costume wasn't enough. I needed a backstory in case anyone got chatty. James was now a successful entrepreneur who just moved from Atlanta and was looking to meet new people. Vague, but believable. The plan was simple. Show up, blend in, observe, and maybe, just maybe, get the kind of proof I needed to confront Rachel without any room for excuses. So there I was, 
suited and booted in a getup that would make the Phantom of the Opera do a double take. I stepped into the masquerade event in San Antonio, a lavish affair oozing with opulence and the faint scent of secrets. My heart was keeping time like a drum roll, pounding away as I threaded through a tapestry of gowns and suits all hiding behind masks. I wasn't just in costume, I was in character. James, the out-of-towner, was on the prowl, but the real me, Tyler, was on a mission. I kept my head down and my eyes sharp, scanning the sea of deception for the one face I knew all too well. And then, like a lighthouse beam cutting through fog, I heard it. Rachel's laughter. It's funny, isn't it? How you can pick out the one laugh you've heard for a decade in a cacophony of mirth. There she was, draped in velvet, a mask adorned with jewels concealing her eyes but not her aura. She was with someone, a guy sporting a grin that I could spot as sleazy from a mile off. I edged closer, every step heavy with the weight of what I was about to do. They hadn't seen me yet, just another masked stranger among many. But as I neared, my heart was pounding like crazy. It was showtime. I slipped through the crowd, made it to their little bubble of betrayal, and stood there for a heartbeat. Rachel was in mid-conversation, a glass of champagne in one hand, her free hand resting on the guy's arm. I reached up, and with all the drama of the evening, I pulled off my mask. Enjoying the party? I asked, my voice steadier than I felt. The look on her face read it, it was like she'd seen a ghost. Her companion, Mr. Sleaze, looked like he was about to choke on his own Adam's apple. Tyler! Rachel gasped, the color draining from her face. What? How? There were a million things I wanted to say, a torrent of questions and accusations. But I just stood there the raw truth hanging between us like a thundercloud. I won't lie, part of me enjoyed the shock on her face, the way her confident demeanor crumbled. But the other part, the part that had loved her, that had shared secrets and dreams and a decade of life, that part was broken, shards of trust piercing my chest. The room spun with whispers now, the masquerade's facade slipping as people started to notice the drama unfolding. I saw Rachel's eyes darting around, her world unraveling in public. After my grand unmasking, there I was, standing in the eye of the storm I'd just kicked up. The murmurs began to rise around us, the masquerade's melody turning to dissonant whispers as the crowd sensed the drama hotter than the latest gossip. Rachel, her mask now nothing more than a cheap prop, looked like a deer in headlights. Her mouth opened and closed, no sound coming out at first and me. I felt the rage building, a tempest that had been gathering strength ever since I first smelled the stink of lies. Her companion, Mr. Tall Darkin, has seen better days. He was trying to slink away, but I wasn't having any of that. I caught his arm and gave him a look that I hoped said, you're part of this show too, buddy. Rachel's composure cracked, the facade fell, and there it was all the lies spilling out of her like water from a broken dam. I didn't mean for it to go this far, she sobbed, her voice cracking. It was just supposed to be fun, a game. A game? My marriage, our life, was a game to her? The crowd was eating it up, but I didn't care about the audience. This was between me and the woman I thought I knew. I stood there, clenching and unclenching my fists, the aggression pulsing through me. I wanted to shout to break something, but I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of seeing me lose control. You call breaking our vows fun? I shot back, my voice low and menacing. I could feel the eyes on us, the weight of judgment, curiosity, and shock. But it was her eyes I was focused on, the ones that couldn't hold my gaze. The silence from her was the final nail. No excuses could bandage the wound she'd ripped open. No apologies could stitch up the trust she'd shredded. Just when I thought the drama peaked, the cheating club, Rachel's band of merry backstabbers, decided it was their turn in the spotlight. I was standing there, my rage just barely leashed, ready to give Rachel a piece of my mind that I could never take back when I felt hands on me. Strong grips, holding me back, as if I was the villain in their twisted play. You need to calm down, man. One of the suit-wearing snakes hissed in my ear, his breath reeking of smugness and expensive cologne. 
Another, a guy whose face was too forgettable to be anything but a henchman, chimes in. She needed someone who was there for her, bro. You weren't. I was seeing red. Every muscle in my body tensed up, ready to unleash the storm inside me. But I'm a thinker, see, a strategist. And I knew that any violence would only play right into their narrative. The unhinged husband, losing it while the poor, misunderstood wife weeps into her lace hanky. So, I did the next best thing. With the world around me blurred by fury, I pulled out my phone, switched on the camera, and started recording. Their faces, Rachel's tear-streaked makeup, the decor they were so proud of, all captured in high definition. Say cheese, I growled, making sure to get a good sweep of the whole scene. The club members, or should I say, co-conspirators, their faces shifted from smug to shocked faster than you can say privacy settings. Then I turned the camera on myself. You see this? This is the face of a man who's done. Done with lies, done with games, and sure as hell done with this exclusive club of infidelity. I could hear Rachel's protests, her feeble attempts at defending the indefensible. Tyler, please, it's not what it looks like. But I was over it. I turned off the camera, pocketed my phone, and shook off the hands still clinging to me. You all deserve each other, I spat out. No dramatic exit music, no slow motion walk, I just left, the chatter and chaos fading behind me. As I stepped out into the cool night air, the silence was deafening compared to the uproar I'd left behind. But it gave me space, space to think, to plan my next move. Because now I wasn't just going to lay down and let them walk over me. I had a video evidence of the exclusive club that wasn't so exclusive anymore. Hey Reddit fam, Tyler here. If you've been following my not so little drama, get ready for the finale. Because when I said game change, I meant it. I posted the video. Yep, that's right. Hit upload and watched as those digital dominoes started to fall. Facebook's algorithm did its thing and the views started climbing. It was wildfire, the kind that you see in those forest documentaries. Unstoppable, blazing, absolute. But it wasn't just me in this. Austin's finest keyboard warriors, the good folks of the internet who still believe in right and wrong, they jumped in. Shares, comments, even a couple of those react videos where people watch it for the first time. Their faces, names, and their dirty little secret club. It all got dragged into the sunlight. Of course, Rachel was livid. My phone blew up with messages, missed calls, a symphony of notifications. How could you? You've ruined us. Take it down, Tyler. But the thing was, she'd already done a bang-up job of ruining us all by herself. I didn't reply. What was there to say? Thanks for the memories and the lessons in betrayal? Nah, I just blocked her number. She'd become just another contact in the list, no different from a telemarketer or a spam bot. Now, don't think I came out of this unscathed. A guy doesn't go through something like this without some cuts and bruises on the inside. But here's the kicker. I also came out stronger, wiser, with a little more grit under my fingernails. I wasn't about to sit around nursing wounds and letting the moss grow under my feet. No sir, it was time for a fresh start, a new chapter. So, I decided to learn cold approaches. You know, the art of walking up to a stranger and starting a conversation. No masks, no secrets, just me and my new Foon boldness. It's not about finding the next Rachel. It's about finding Tyler again. The guy who can chat up someone new without an agenda. The guy who's not afraid to take a step forward, even if he's still brushing off the dust from a fall. So here I am, hitting the streets, coffee shops, parks, wherever life buzzes and real people show their faces without the need for a masquerade. And it's thrilling, like the first time you ride a bike without training wheels. A little wobbly, but damn, it feels good to be in control. I'm signing off now, Reddit. Thanks everyone for listening, and if you would subscribe to the channel, that would mean the world to me. Have a great rest of your day or night. Ever since I met Laura, I always believed that a bond built on trust was unbreakable. We had been the envy of our circle, with our tales of love lasting over two decades. Little did I know that a simple envelope would shatter that belief. It was a crisp autumn afternoon, 
the kind that paints the trees with a fiery hue and the wind carries secrets. As I walked towards my home after a long day at work, I noticed a stark white envelope lying in our mailbox. No stamp, no address, just a simple handwritten mark on the front. Curiosity got the better of me, and I swiftly tore it open. The letter inside was typed, and the words sent chills down my spine. Open your eyes, Mark. Love can blind, but the truth can hurt even more. Laura isn't as faithful as you think. I felt my heart skip a beat. Laura? My Laura? Cheating on me? No, it can't be. We had spent more than 20 years together, sharing not just a home, but dreams, hopes, secrets, and every imaginable emotion. This had to be a sick joke, but who would do such a thing, and why? I looked around, half expecting to see a pair of sneering eyes watching me from the shadows, enjoying the aftermath of their cruel prank. But the street was quiet, with just the rustling leaves and my racing heartbeat breaking the silence. I hid the letter in my briefcase, deciding not to share it with Laura just yet. Instead, I resolved to keep an eye on her, to watch for signs that could confirm or refute this terrible accusation. I believed in her, in us. Yet, there was this gnawing feeling at the pit of my stomach, like a worm eating away at the apple of our love. Over the next few days, everything seemed normal. Laura was her usual chirpy self, filling our home with her laughter and love. But then I noticed it, Robert, our close friend for years, a man I'd shared countless memories with, was around more than usual. At first, I dismissed it as mere coincidence, but the signs started to add up. The stolen glances they exchanged when they thought I wasn't looking, the hushed conversations that ceased when I entered a room, the secret smiles that hinted at shared secrets. I wanted to confront her, to ask her outright, but every time I mustered the courage, she'd look at me with those same eyes filled with love, and my doubts would melt away. But the envelope's message remained, lurking in the shadows, reminding me that sometimes, what seems too good to be true usually is. Days turned into weeks, and the gnawing suspicion inside me continued to grow. Each interaction between Laura and Robert became magnified, every whisper echoing loudly in my mind every touch sending electric shocks down my spine. The world around me started to shift, with doubt clouding every beautiful memory we'd built. I had always been a man of action, so I decided to dive deeper. I began keeping track of Laura's movements, something I never imagined I'd ever do. I made notes of the time she'd take calls outside, her sudden late-night outings, and those weekend get-togethers with girlfriends that I'd never heard of. My journal started filling up with these observations, but it wasn't just notes, it was a testament to a crumbling foundation. One day, as I was making another entry, I stumbled upon a receipt from a fancy restaurant. The date was from one of those nights Laura had claimed to have a girl's night out. But what caught my attention was the total, far too high for just one person. My heart raced as I recalled her coming home that night, her makeup slightly smudged, and her demeanor slightly off. With the receipt as my cue, I decided to dig deeper. I turned to technology for help. I installed a discreet tracking app on Laura's phone. The sinking feeling of betraying her trust was overwhelmed by the burning need to know the truth. And soon, the app gave me exactly what I was looking for. The locations she frequented matched Robert's. They were together at parks, cafes, and even, on one occasion, a secluded lakeside cabin. One evening, after another, late night at work, I confronted Laura. Her face turned ashen as I listed my observations, my voice trembling, barely concealing the heartbreak. But to my surprise, she laughed. A forced, nervous laugh. She accused me of being paranoid, questioning my trust in our love and reminding me of our years together. Mark, she said, looking straight into my eyes, you're seeing shadows where there are none. Her gaslighting began to make me question everything. Maybe I was being paranoid. Maybe all this was just a figment of my overactive imagination. But then, a ray of hope, or perhaps despair, came from the most unexpected source. Robert's wife, Emily. She called me one morning, her voice trembling. 
She too had found signs, hints, and whispers of betrayal. She too had been dismissed, laughed at, and accused of being delusional. We were two souls, broken by the same deceit, seeking answers in a world that seemed to be shifting under our feet. Together, we decided to find undeniable proof and confront the liars that had torn our worlds apart. The hunt was on, and the stakes had never been higher. It was on one of those cool, foggy mornings that I found solace in our town's park. The mist clung to the trees, and the world felt muffled, like a scene straight out of a dream. As I walked down the familiar paths, each step seemed to echo with memories of happier times, back when doubt and heartbreak were foreign concepts. Amidst the silence, I heard a familiar voice call out to me. Mark! Turning around, I saw Jane, a mutual friend of Laura's and mine. With her sun-kissed hair and always comforting smile, Jane had been an ever-present figure in our lives. She'd been there through our highs and lows, our joys and sorrows. She approached, her eyes showing a hint of concern. You look like you've seen better days, she remarked gently. We sat on a nearby bench, the cold metal, a stark contrast to the warmth of memories associated with this place. With a deep breath, I spilled everything. The letter, the tracking, the confrontation, and the alliance with Emily. As I narrated, I could see a mixture of sympathy and concern in Jane's eyes. When I finished, there was a heavy pause, the weight of my revelations hanging in the air. After what felt like an eternity, Jane finally spoke, her voice filled with a sadness I had never heard before. Mark, she began, hesitatingly, there's something I think you should know. She revealed that she had seen Laura and Robert together on multiple occasions over the past few months. They had been at cafes, malls, and even at Jane's own birthday party, always finding corners to whisper, share fleeting touches, and exchange looks filled with a secret intimacy. Jane hadn't thought much of it initially, assuming it was just close friendship. But as the instances grew, her own suspicions began to mount. She even recalled a particular evening when she'd caught them sharing a much too intimate moment in her garden. Jane's revelations were like a hammer to my already fragile heart, but what she said next was even more shattering. Robert was known to be manipulative. In the past, he had charmed and deceived others, leaving a trail of broken relationships in his wake. His modus operandi was always the same. Befriend, charm, and then destroy. Laura wasn't his first victim, and if left unchecked, she wouldn't be his last. I felt a whirlwind of emotions, anger, betrayal, sadness. But more than anything, I felt a sense of determination. With Jane's insights, Emily's support, and my own observations, I was building a case. A case not just against Robert, but against the shadows of doubt and deceit that had crept into my life. It was time to bring everything to light and confront the two people who had betrayed me the most. The storm was coming, and I was at its center. The following week, I meticulously planned the confrontation. With Jane and Emily's help, we arranged for a dinner at my house. The pretense was simple, a reunion of old friends, a gathering to reminisce and celebrate our shared history. Robert and Laura suspected nothing, or at least they showed no signs of it. The evening started off pleasantly. The golden glow of the setting sun filtered through the curtains and soft music played in the background. Laughter and chatter filled the room, creating an illusion of harmony. But beneath the surface, Tension crackled like electricity. After dinner, as we moved to the living room for coffee, I took the lead. With a deep breath, I began. Tonight isn't just about memories or celebrating friendship. It's about truth and confronting the shadows that have crept into our lives. The room went silent. Laura's face turned pale and Robert shifted uncomfortably. I continued, laying out all the evidence, from the letter to Jane's revelations, from the tracking results to the emotional pain that their deceit had inflicted on Emily and me. The atmosphere was thick with emotion. Accusations flew, voices raised, tears flowed, and for the first time, the mask of deception started to crumble. 
Robert, in a desperate bid to deflect blame, tried to paint himself as the victim. He spoke of loneliness, of feeling unappreciated, and how Laura was a beacon of hope in his desolate life. Laura, on the other hand, seemed lost and confused. She alternated between expressing remorse and accusing me of smothering her with my insecurities. She admitted to being swayed by Robert's charm, but also expressed her frustration at feeling taken for granted in our relationship. Jane and Emily were my pillars of support. They countered every lie, every deflection, reminding Robert and Laura of the pain they had caused, the trust they had broken, and the lives they had torn apart. Hours seemed to pass. The room was a battleground of emotions, and the scars of betrayal were laid bare for all to see. By the end, as the first light of dawn started to peek through, one thing was clear. Relationships were forever altered. There was no going back, no healing the wounds. All that was left were the pieces of shattered trust and the daunting task of moving forward. As everyone left, the house was eerily silent, but it was also free from the chains of deceit. I sat alone, reflecting on the storm that had passed, feeling both drained and liberated. The confrontation had been painful, but it had also been necessary. The road ahead was uncertain, but at least now it was based on truth. In the wake of that tumultuous night, life took on an almost surreal quality. The town, once filled with fond memories, now bore the scars of betrayal at every turn. Whispers followed me wherever I went, some filled with sympathy, others with morbid curiosity. The first few days were a blur of pain and numbness. Emily and I leaned on each other, finding solace in shared anguish. Our meetings became frequent, and a unique bond began to form between us. It wasn't romantic, but rather an understanding, a mutual support system built on the ruins of deceit. Laura, overwhelmed by guilt, retreated from social life. She moved out, seeking solace in solitude, grappling with the consequences of her actions. From mutual friends, I learned she had started therapy, trying to find answers and perhaps a path to redemption. Robert, true to his manipulative nature, attempted to spin the story in his favor. Painting himself as a misunderstood soul caught in the crossfire of emotions. But his charms had limits. With the truth out in the open, many began to see through his facade. He faced social ostracization and was even forced to step down from several community committees. About a month after the confrontation, I received a handwritten letter, its familiar script tugging at my heartstrings. It was from Laura. She wrote of her remorse, her realization of the depths of her betrayal, and the pain she had inflicted, not just on me, but on herself as well. She didn't ask for forgiveness. She merely wanted me to understand her side of the story. Her loneliness in our relationship, her vulnerability, and how Robert had expertly exploited it. Reading the letter was an emotional roller coaster. Anger, pity, sadness, and love swirled inside me. While it didn't change the past or mend the broken bonds, it provided a perspective, a glimpse into the human frailty that led to the betrayal. The town, ever resilient, slowly started to heal. New stories replaced the old, and life resumed its pace. But for those of us at the heart of the storm, the journey was just beginning. Emily, finding strength in her pain, started a support group for individuals dealing with betrayal. It became her mission to help others navigate the treacherous waters of deceit and come out stronger. As for me, I turned to writing, pouring my emotions, my experiences, and my lessons into words. The journal that had once been a record of suspicion transformed into a memoir of healing. With Jane's encouragement, I even got it published. The book, titled Shadows of Deceit, became a local bestseller and resonated with many who had faced similar betrayals. The final chapter of my story was marked by a simple yet profound event. On the anniversary of the confrontation, I visited the same park where Jane had revealed the truth to me. Sitting on the familiar bench, I took out Laura's letter, reread it one last time, and then set it aflame. As the ashes floated away, carried by the gentle breeze, it symbolized my letting go, my release from the chains of the past, and my first step towards a future of healing and hope.